From Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is The Pulse. Hello, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Marissa Taché. And I'm Melanie De Silva. Welcome back to Sacred Heart. Last week, Bill Cosby was sentenced to three to ten years for sexual assault. But sexual assault is not limited to athletes, actors, and actresses. Last month, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court made public a 1,400-page grand jury report. The report accused at least 300 priests of child sex abuse of more than 1,000 victims throughout the state. In July, former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, previously the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., was forced to resign his cardinalship. This followed numerous accusations of sexually abusing adult seminarians and children. Sacred Heart President Dr. John Patillo decided he had to take a stand. In a strongly worded blog post, Dr. Patillo addressed his concerns. Sacred Heart University's mission statement embraces a vision for social justice and educates students in mind, body, and spirit to prepare them personally and professionally to make a difference in the global community which is why, following the allegations of sexual misconduct and abuse against hundreds of American bishops, including American Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, President Dr. Patillo felt compelled to speak out. The reason I wrote the blog, and it was after consultation with um, my board leadership, we had an obligation as lady um, to speak out. This is not the bishop's church, it is the people of God's church. On August 22nd, Dr. Patillo used his weekly blog post to comment on the news. Regarding the uh, initial report about Theodore McCarrick, um, I wasn't too surprised because of the rumors that had been floating for years prior. What I was surprised about was that so many other bishops claimed ignorance at never even hearing the rumors. Um, I find that hard to believe. Distinguished professor of Catholic thought, Michael Higgins, was also not too surprised by the reports. Well, I wasn't surprised in one sense, um, in that we've had an ex experience in the global church uh, in relation to cardinals who have abused their authority and their power and have preyed indeed upon seminarians and younger priests. The first reformation was a result of indulgences and power abuse within the church. Some, like Dr. Higgins, are calling for a second reformation. Because of the grand jury report in Pennsylvania, uh, following immediately upon the McCarrick uh, revelation, and now we have a report leaked from Germany, and we have uh, other instances surfacing and a possible resignation of the Cardinal of Washington. All these things are in the air right now. You can see that the call for, for reform is real and it's not going to go away. Others, like Dr. Patillo, are relating the Catholic Church crisis to the Me Too movement. The question of uh, is the church entering a Me Too movement, um, it might be that kind of progression. I know our Professor Higgins believes that this is a another phase of a reformation of the church. Uh, I personally believe uh, strongly in the spirit. Both Dr. Patillo and Dr. Higgins agree there is a cry for reformation. They urge students to participate in the conversation. At the end of his blog, Dr. Patillo asked students to sign a petition. Dr. Higgins suggests reaching out to professors. I do all these things because that's, we're responsible for providing enlightened commentary on complex issues so people understand them better. That's what a university does. Dr. Patillo and Dr. Higgins wanted to make sure the conversation didn't end with Sacred Heart. We're in the process of doing uh, consortium with Fordham and Fairfield to discuss these issues on a broad base. The consortium will serve as yet another way students can get involved. They should let their voices be heard. Um, they should truly express their belief that they are the church. And I think that way we come out with a much stronger and much richer faith. From Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is Olivia Middleman for The Pulse. It's been a busy week for Olivia. She also interviewed Allie Raisman, who is the second most decorated American gymnast of all time. Allie is also a survivor of sexual abuse. She was here on campus for Sacred Heart's lecture series. When Olivia asked Allie, you mentioned that people often tell you their story. How do you balance helping others when what happened to you is still so raw? 
Allie responded, I'm still trying to figure out that balance, how to be as supportive as I can, but also how to make sure I'm taking care of myself. Victoria Muscal, editor-in-chief of The Spectrum, also interviewed Allie. She's here with Melanie to talk about their meeting. Hi, Victoria. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. For starters now, what was Allie's main message of the night? Allie was on campus as part of the Student Affairs Lecture Series to promote her new book, Fierce, and also to talk about her success after the Olympic podium. And now, what did Allie have to say about her new role as being an advocate? She really stressed the importance of advocating not just on the behalf of the gymnasts who were assaulted in her case, but also on behalf of survivors who don't have a platform such as her. And now, was there any advice that Allie wanted to give to survivors or even bystanders? Allie was firm in her conviction, telling survivors that it is never, ever your fault, and that no matter how long it takes to share your story publicly, that you are still valid. And she told bystanders to look out for one another, and that if something feels wrong, that it most likely is wrong, and to look out for others. Thank you, Victoria, for being here with us today. Allie is definitely a strong athlete and is definitely still a strong advocate and will be in the future. Absolutely. Marissa? Coming up, we're taking a look at our own athletes on campus with season updates on the football and soccer teams. Welcome back. The Sacred Heart football team is on a roll. They began their season ranked number one in the NEC and are now 3-1. They also had a huge win in their first conference game. With the big homecoming game ahead on October 6, here's Joe Siegel with more. With a win at home in their season opener against Lafayette, coped with a second victory on enemy turf at Bucknell, and their win at Wagner, the Pyros are tied for first place tied for first place with Bryan in the NEC standings. The Pioneers defeated Wagner 41-14 in a present performance by quarterback Kevin Duke. Okay. A key player for the Pioneers so far this season has been senior running back Jordan Meacham, who has rushed for a total of 386 yards so far this fall. Meacham has shown his quickness and agility through his leadership on the field and has set career highs in the first two games earning him NEC Offensive Player of the Week after the win against Bucknell. Also keep an eye on rookie running back Julius Chestnut who earned NEC Rookie of the Week after the Pilots' first victory. Chestnut had an impressive season opener against Lafayette, rushing for a total of 57 yards and scoring two touchdowns. There's no other leader in football and offense like the quarterback. Sacred Heart graduate student Kevin Duke has flashed in both departments from both his running and passing game by being the power starting quarterback for the last two seasons. Duke is even not afraid to take it into the end zone himself. This rushing touchdown against Lafayette brought the Pilots to a 21-14 lead, and then they went on to win 30-14. Duke has recorded 606 passing yards and 173 rushing yards so far this season. Duke had a career high in touchdowns, recording four against Wagner and throwing for 322 yards. Sacred Heart's defense has shown prominent play so far this season. The Pioneers' defense has now held their opponents on the 300 yards of total offense in each of their three first games. Defensive lineman Chris Eigenman has been vital to Shoe's defense success, recording at least one sack in each of the games played so far. Eigenman earned Defensive Player of the Week for Week 2. Mm -hmm. 
Duke and Meacham have been impressive every game so far this season, but it was freshman receiver Nathan Brantley who had a big role along with the upperclassman at Sacred Heart Twin over at Wagner. He rolled in three catches for 118 yards, including two touchdown receptions, one for 45 yards and the other one for 62 yards. Brantley earned NEC Co-Rookie of the Week, while Duke won Offensive Player of the Week. The defense held All-American back Ryan Fulz to 161 net rushing yards and no touchdowns. The Sacred Heart football team was handed its first loss of the season on Saturday afternoon in a 43-24 setback at Cornell. The Pioneers, who had only allowed 34 points through their first three games, surrendered 36 points in the opening half before allowing just 7 points in the second half. Shu had four different players with at least 40 yards receiving, three players with at least 40 yards rushing, and had three players tally their first career touchdowns in the game. On October 6th, the Pioneers will return home to Campus Field for homecoming weekend and a breast cancer awareness game against the University of Pennsylvania's Quakers. Sacred Heart has finished in fifth place in the NEC for the past two seasons. After starting at number one, they're looking to continue this momentum to finish at the top of their conference. Back to you, Marissa. In other sports news, earlier this month, the 2018 U.S. Open made many headlines. 20-year-old Naomi Osaka became the first Japanese player to win a major singles title in the history of tennis outperforming 23-time Grand Slam champion Serena Williams. On the men's side, Novak Djokovic defeated Juan Martin Del Potro to win the Open and claim his 14th Grand Slam title. This season, one shoe student had a courtside view of the Open action. John Goodno was a U.S. Open ball boy for both the 2017 and 2018 tournaments. Goodno says that it's not an easy road to the Open. He commented, I got involved by training out of around 500 people for 80 rookie spots. Goodno also mentioned that over the past few years, he has had the chance to be on the court with famous players such as Sloane Stevens, Alexander Yaverez, and John Eisner. You know, I've been watching the U.S. Open, and I think it's so cool how he was able to be that close to those professional athletes. Yeah, I think it'd be amazing to be there and see even Serena Williams in that match. It must have been crazy. Yeah, I think it's just really cool. And after the break, we'll head over to West Campus to learn how state-of-the-art tech is flourishing. Plus, a tour through Fairfield County's newest craft breweries. Welcome back. With the addition of West Campus, Sacred Heart University is getting bigger and better. We go to our reporter, Jack Sullivan, to see more of what West Campus has to offer. With the growth of our campus, student body, and academic curriculum, West Campus gives us the opportunity to keep up with that growth. In November of 2016, Sacred Heart University purchased General Electric's global headquarters right down Jefferson Street. West Campus is 66 acres of property with 550,000 square feet of building space. It is now home to two of the five academic colleges on campus, and most recently the School of Computer Science and Engineering. Professor Tolga, the director of the program, 
believes his students can do really good work outside of the classroom and also benefit the school in a big way. So engineering is uh, started last year, so we have computer engineering program, we have dual, en dual degree engineering programs, and we also have electrical engineering that is about to start. Uh, so we don't have too many students right now, but what we are able to offer to the campus is that uh, when you have an idea, uh, but you have no idea how you're going to prototype it, how you're going to make it happen, that's where we come in. So we can really help uh, people to get their ideas into prototypes and even products. Students in the engineering program get to excel through their work because of the new state-of-the-art technology that West Campus has to offer. With this major, once you're outside of the classroom, there's really never the answer of no. And that's what this building kind of goes with as well. If you have any idea or any project, any kind of semblance of something that you want to create, you can come to this building and you can make it a reality. One of West Campus's roles is to be the center of an innovation center that Sacred Heart is trying to build upon throughout the next couple of years. Yeah, so the, this, this uh, area uh, was uh, acquired from GE uh, for a reason, to, to make it an innovation campus. So, uh, so this building, we're already doing a lot of uh, renovations um, in the building. So there's going to be a 10,000 square feet makerspace where you can prototype and make things happen. Looking around the lab and talking to some of the students and even the professors, you see a lot of the number 22. So 22 is uh, our uh, campaign, if you will, is that the uh, engineering program itself will run 22 events in one academic year. Right now, you know, we have this in a beautiful building and beautiful, beautiful space, like a maker space. Uh, so very, very excited. Sacred Heart students and faculty should be very excited about what's going on at West Campus. For The Pulse, I'm Jack Sullivan, Fairfield, Connecticut. Did you know that there are 8,647 craft breweries in the United States and that right here in Connecticut, we've got 78 of them? Within the Fairfield community, there are two craft breweries and Danielle Veroni visited one not too far from campus. Let's take the tour. In the past five years, the amount of craft breweries in the United States has more than doubled and now there are just over 8,600. The Aspetuck Brew Lab in Black Rock, Connecticut is one of the more recent additions to that list. Welcome to Aspetuck Brew Lab, first brewery in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut in 70 years. I'm Peter Coles, co-founder and CEO and brewer uh, for the brewery. Peter Coles had been brewing as an amateur brewer at home for about 16 or 17 years before opening the business. Here's what he had to say about his motivation for brewing on a larger scale. I had um, gotten to a point where I was competing nationally on a pretty large scale uh, in, in brewing and had done fairly well and had brewed a little bit with some commercial brewers and that really kick-started my effort into building the business plan and uh, building this out. Peter and his wife, both having business degrees, were able to seize the opportunity to make brewing a full-time gig. It only took about two years of planning before they were able to open up the brew lab, which has been serving the area for the past three years. The Aspetuck Brew Lab was the 29th craft brewery to open up in Connecticut, which now has over 75. When I asked Peter how they keep up with older companies, he summed it up into one word, innovation. It's a matter of keeping things fresh, keeping things, uh, pe keeping people engaged and interested in your product and in, 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 the, in the beer industry as a whole. One of the ways they keep their company new and exciting is through the Beer It Forward initiative. This is the Aspetuck Brew Lab's take on paying it forward. You can buy a card for the price of a beer and leave it for someone you know that needs it or give it to a complete stranger. They take paying it forward one step further by giving 10% of those proceeds to their local partner, Food Rescue Fairfield County. Our, our model here is, is we have, we have a, a small brewery, so we're able to play around with small batches of beer, and this is our scientific lab back here. Back in their lab is where they get to create all of the beers that are going to be sold in the tap room, as well as those sold locally. I asked Peter what it's like to brew beer on such a large scale, to which he describes the process as being very similar to the way he would brew beer at home, but of course a lot more challenging. One of my final questions for Peter was how he chooses what flavors will go into each beer and get sold to the public. Here's what he said. So we're always looking to do something a little different than the, what's, what's being done. Granted, IPAs are driving the market. We make, make IPAs, we do them a little differently. 
Uh, we're also looking to see what hasn't been done. What can we do that's a little innovative and fun and exciting, play with some new ingredients, experiment with some yeasts, and uh, roll out something different to our consumers. When it comes to drinking local, you get a chance to meet the person behind the creation of your beer. In visiting, it is easy to see that one of Peter's top priorities is in keeping a good connection with his customers. In our tap room, that's our social science lab. So we can test things out on our, uh, on our customers who give us great feedback. And we're always, we're always looking for their feedback because without them, we're not going to be around. And as for the future, the company dreams big. And we're tapping out our capacity here. Our next step is to partner with a larger brewery and contract our uh, product to really move it out to the, uh, to, to the retail channels. I personally can't wait to see what's in store for the Aspatuck Brew Lab. I had an incredible time visiting with Peter, and I encourage everyone to see what our local community has to offer by making a trip to the brewery. For The Pulse, this is Danielle Veroni in Fairfield, Connecticut. And remember, drink local. Wow, that looked really cool. I mean, I can't believe how many breweries have opened up in the past year. I know, and it's great to see them so successful, especially in the small state of Connecticut. Yeah, it's awesome. And that's a wrap for our first episode. We're heading to Reds. For The Pulse, I'm Melanie DeSilva. And I'm Marissa Tache. Thanks for joining us at The Pulse.